Hello all, welcome to the embedded IoT Linux course for Red Blue teams at Pentester Academy. My name is Vivek Ramachandran and I am the instructor for the course. Now in this video, we will understand the booting process of an embedded device in great detail. So let's get started. Now, if we were to architecturally look at an embedded system, we are going to have the SOC, which is the system on chip or the microcontroller. This is really the brains of the system. Now the SOC is going to require some kind of a persistent storage, such as flash storage, where the operating system or programs it has to run is going to you know, be stored across reboots. It will also require you know, RAM where it can load programs at runtime and run. Now, apart from this, depending on the functionality of this embedded system, there may be different peripheral ports, debug ports, GPIO pins, etc. available. Now, it's important to note that most modern SOCs uh, typically support dozens of different external peripheral devices. However, the number of pins on them are sometimes not enough to be able to interface with every device they support. And this is really where uh, pin multiplexing happens, where we can configure the SOC to go ahead and use certain pins and only go and talk with certain peripheral devices with them. Okay. So now let's go ahead and understand the Linux boot process from an embedded devices perspective. The first stage is really the bootloaders. Now, when we go ahead and power a board, what happens is control passes to a location called the reset vector. This is something the manufacturer has already pre-programmed onto the board. Now at the reset vector, typically, the SOC's boot ROM loader exists, and at that point, the ROM boot loader will start executing. Now, typically, the task of the ROM boot loader is to set up some basic hardware and then go about finding the first stage boot loader from a boot device. So this boot device could be, you know, on a network, could be over a memory bus, could be USB, uh, you know, could be an SD card, whatnot. So once the ROM bootloader has gone through the different boot devices and located the first stage bootloader, it goes ahead and loads the first stage bootloader typically into the SOC's internal memory and then passes control to it. Now the first stage bootloader will then go ahead, fetch the second stage bootloader which will then be loaded into RAM and the first stage bootloader passes control to the second stage bootloader, which then starts running. Now, keep in mind that interestingly, I'm always saying passes control rather than calling. And, and this is very important to distinguish. Typically, when you say pass control, what you actually mean is after that, the, the previous program which was running in a way ceases to exist. When you say calls, it actually means that when the next stage finishes running, it will actually return back to the previous stage, which does not happen with bootloaders at all. So when we say the ROM bootloader passes control to the first stage bootloader, that means after that, the ROM bootloader isn't going to run till the next reset. The first stage bootloader once again passes control to the second stage and then ceases to exist. Now, Depending on the embedded system, there could be just one stage or, you know, multiple stages. And all of this depends on the architecture of that embedded system and how many stages it would require uh, to load, you know, a powerful bootloader like U-Boot. And we'll get into that in the context of the BeagleBone Black in just a bit. Now, the second stage bootloader uh, its primary responsibility is to go ahead and load the kernel and the device tree into RAM and basically look at its own settings, which could be statically embedded or this could be some kind of an external configuration file. And then using that, start the kernel, pass the kernel the boot arguments, 
and that's it. At that point on, the second stage bootloader ceases to exist and the Linux kernel takes over. The kernel in turn is of course going to initialize, you know, the different hardware components, is going to go ahead, look into the boot arguments passed by the bootloader, locate the root file system, and then it'll mount the root file system. Once it successfully does that, it is going to search for the init process on that file system, which is really the first user space process with PID zero. And then once it invokes the init process, init in turn will look at its configuration files and start other user space processes. So this uh, I think is a very good summary of how the boot process works for most Linux systems. And now we will focus on understanding how this works for the BeagleBone Black. Now, as we discussed in the previous video, the BeagleBone Black is actually based on uh, a Texas Instrument SOC called the AM335X series. So let's actually go to their website and look at what this is. So I'm first on, I've first gone to the BeagleBone website where, you know, they have a link to the AM335X. So you can open this up in a new tab, scroll down and then go to the technical documents page. There we are, AM3358, uh, Sitara, ARM, Cortex A8. Fantastic. Let's actually open up the data sheet in a new tab. And there are a bunch of documents. And typically, there are documents available here for people building hardware with this SOC, as well as people writing software for this SOC, right? So depending on which category you fall in, uh, some of these documents may be relevant to you. Now, if you look at it, there is a ton of documentation in here. The one we are kind of really interested in is from a software perspective is what they call the TRM or the technical reference manual. And you can clearly see this is pretty huge in size. So let's actually open this up. I mean, it's all text, right? I mean, two to three MB, of course, doesn't, this is 23 megs isn't that big, but when it's all text, that's huge. And of course, it's 5,000 pages. So you can clearly appreciate how complicated writing software for such a device would be uh, and how large a team you would really require to go ahead and you know kind of build out an embedded system, its software, etc. Okay, and this is the data sheet. Okay, let's hold on to both of these. Let's let's keep them open in the tab. Now let's go back to our slides. Okay, so what I've done is from the data sheet, I've actually copied over the functional block diagram of the AM335X. Now, don't worry, some of this stuff is going to look complicated at first glance, but let me assure you, it's actually really simple. 5,000 pages is intimidating, but most of what is written there is, is really very crisp, beautiful technical documentation. Uh, and I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> want to encourage you to read all of that, but if, if you can, at least go through some of the relevant parts. Uh, SOC documentation is one of the most exhaustive, you know, kind of beautiful documentation you will ever get to read in the technical business. It's simply because if Texas Instruments or any of the other guys don't document this properly, no one is going to go ahead and build a board and write software for these uh, you know, SOCs and microcontrollers and all of that. So they do an amazing job at documenting. Okay, so we see that this is an ARM Cortex A8, which can go up to one gigahertz. So the reason they say up to one gigahertz is most of the time this is hardware configurable. So based on certain pin settings, you can tell the processor, uh, you know, what is the clock speed it needs to kind of go ahead and use. Now it has an L1, L2 cache, but the key thing which strikes my eye, of course, is the ROM and the RAM. 
And keep in mind, this is inside the SOC. So this is inside that little chip. So this only has 176 kilobyte of ROM. This is the read only memory. And then a 64 KB RAM section is there. And there is also a 64 KB shared RAM section. So as you can clearly see, uh, the net amount of RAM seems to be around 128. The ROM is 176. Clearly not much at all, <laughs> right? This almost uh, takes you back to uh, probably when personal computers started, right? 64 KB. <laughs> now, of course, this is this is more than sufficient for uh, you know the the SOC to do its job, and we'll talk about it in just a bit. Uh, now, apart from that, you have a lot of peripheral controllers. So you have the display controllers over here. And then after that, you know, you have all the external ports. So we clearly see, uh, you know, all of these serial ports. So you have UART, SPI, I2C bus, uh, CAN, USB, etc. And there are a bunch of other as well, right? You also have, uh, you know, parallel devices such as the MMC, the SD, uh, card, etc. And then the GPIO ports, and then you have memory interface controllers and whatnot. So this is an extremely complicated device. Now keep in mind, it says six UART ports, right? Uh, but you will have to do the pin multiplexing if you really wanted all six of them to be exposed. So keep these in mind. On the BeagleBone Black, you might only find one or two UARTs because using the pin multiplexing, that's what they've decided to expose, right? Now, some of it is configurable very easily, um, but a lot of times if, you know, things are hardwired to those pins already, you might probably not want to kind of play too much with them. Okay, so the, the key takeaway is we have a very small ROM and we very a very small internal RAM. Now, if we look at the Cortex-A8's memory map, what you would actually find is that the boot ROM uh, is, is really the one we were kind of talking about over here. So in the previous slide, 176 ROM. And if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see 128 plus 48, which is 176. So this entire is actually the boot ROM, right? Uh, and that is the place where execution begins after the processor resets. Okay, now the little boot ROM code which we are talking about, right, which is just 176 KB, uh, how advanced is it really? I mean, you know, what is the architecture? What can it really do for us? Now, you will be completely surprised and shocked if this is the first time you're dealing with SOCs at such a low level that the boot ROM actually is a reasonably complicated piece of software and actually pretty well accomplished software. Uh, if you kind of look at the public ROM code architecture, which is available, you know, with the technical reference manual, you'll actually see there are kind of, you know, uh, library support, not so, my bad, not library support, but rather, you know, support for UART, USB, SPI, XIP, right? XIP is execution in place. So these are devices where you can pretty much just execute from the device uh, without having to copy it out to RAM or anything else. And of course, hardware support, we have MMC SD card, this is important to us. And they also support FAT, which is interesting, TFTP boot P, which means it might be able to go ahead and do a network boot, uh, a bunch of stuff in here. Now, I'd just like to draw your attention to the FAT part, the UART part, and then the MMC SD card part, okay? So the key takeaway is even though the boot ROM code is just 176 KB, and of course it probably doesn't occupy that entire space with actual code, uh, it is fairly complicated and the boot ROM code already supports talking to MMC SD cards and also supports the FAT file system, right? These are two important things you need to remember. Let's move on. So, if we actually open up the, the SOC manuals, and this might be a good training ground in case later on you're interested. So I've opened up the technical reference manual. Uh, 
and uh, what I showed you, you know, a couple of minutes back was actually the, the memory map. Here it is. So the boot ROM exists right here at this memory location. You'll actually find a ton of uh, other things also memory mapped. So when you hear about, you know, memory mapped uh, IO, you know, you can now kind of understand how all of that works. Okay. So now let's actually go to the initialization part, which is what happens when the system initializes. So this seems to be documented in chapter 26. Okay. Now this device, the AM335X, the SOC actually supports two different uh, kinds of boots. One is the high secure boot or the HS device and the other is the general purpose device. So we are going to be using more of the, the GP device and not the high secure device. The high secure device, if you notice, is kind of doing the trusted boot stuff, right? So it requires a digitally signed uh, you know, piece of firmware and or else it's not going to boot it. So we are going to be looking at the general purpose device and in a later series, we might look at uh, devices which have trusted boot and, you know, different ways by which people have compromised and what are the attack vectors, etc. But in this course, I'm just going to, you know, focus on the general purpose device. So the SOC manual has a ton of details on like how all of this works and you know, kind of spread over probably a couple of hundred pages. Now, what I've done is I've just taken the important parts and put it into the presentation. So just so you know, all of this is from the technical reference manual. Uh, but your nice instructor <laughs> Vivek Ramachandran has gone through the pains of reading not the whole TRM. I'm not crazy. Uh, but, you know, the important relevant parts and uh, kind of gotten all of that, you know, juicy stuff into the slides. So the slide should be more than enough. But if you are more inquisitive, you can always go back and look at the technical reference manual. I've also mentioned the page number for the next couple of slides from where I've picked up uh, many of these flowcharts and diagrams. Cool. So let's continue. So the system starts up and then there is some basic initialization. And of course, all of this is now, you know, the ROM code, which is executing, right? The SOC ROM code is what is executing. After that, we go into the main routine where the stack is set up. And then after that, the ROM bootloader goes ahead and sets up the watchdog timer. So if you look at the documentation, it actually states that the watchdog timer is going to give, uh, you know, the ROM bootloader code around three minutes to find a boot device and to load the next stage. If it doesn't do this within three minutes, it's probably going to reset the board. Interesting. So after the watchdog timer has been set up, uh, the next job is, is really kind of to go ahead and set up the clock. So, you know, it's kind of going to look at the phased loop, uh, phased loop loop. And based on that, it is going to set the clock settings, right? So PLLs are very fundamental or phased locked loops. It's almost like a tongue twister. <laughs> uh, and using that, you basically set the system clock. Now, once that is done, the ROM bootloader is now going to try and see how it can boot the next stage. So of course, to boot the next stage, uh, the most logical thing is where is the next stage, right? It definitely isn't on the SOC because the SOC only had 176 KB. So this is going to be external to the SOC. So how does the ROM boot loader go about figuring out where to find the next stage? Now, once again, the order in which the ROM boot loader is going to search for a boot device is something uh, which the hardware designers have kind of gone ahead and decided by using different pins at highs and lows and that tells the SOC what is the order of boot to be followed, right? So we come here booting, set the booting device list based on the uh, boot configuration settings, sysboot pins or sysboot pins. And for each of those devices, figure out if it is a peripheral boot or if it's a memory boot. Now in our case, we are going to be doing uh, 
a boot using the SD card. So it's actually going to be memory booting, right? So what we will actually do from here is kind of go down the memory booting part. And if it succeeds, it kind of continues. If not, it's going to go back, try the next device. And then it'll kind of, uh, and finally, I think if it fails, it goes into a dead loop. Okay. So MMC SD booting. So how is this going to work? So assuming that the MMC SD, uh, you know, kind of card is in the list, the ROM boot loader is going to initialize the driver. And then after that, decide whether the next stage boot loader is on the SD card in either ROM mode, or is it there as a boot file? Now this gets interesting. So raw mode is really where we just put the next stage bootloader and the file name of the next stage bootloader basically is MLO. So the next stage bootloader can actually be put into raw mode, which it currently says, you know, has to be either at offset zero um, or uh, from zero, the first 128 KB or then up to 256 or 384. Alternately, what it can actually do is read from a fat partition on the SD card. So based on this, we can choose one of these different options to locate the first stage bootloader. Now what we will do is we will go ahead and use the fat option during this entire series, but I will also show you how to do the raw mode boot where we will use DD to write the first stage bootloader and the second stage bootloader onto these exact locations and then boot the device, right? But given it supports FAT, I would prefer it because it's very easy to move around the files and play with it as you're learning different things in this course. So keep in mind, what we will do is put the first stage bootloader, uh, you know, with a file name called MLO onto the fat partition of our SD card. Okay. So let's actually do a quick recap uh, of what we've learned so far and then add on to that. So the SOC ROM bootloader is within the SOC, of course, very small 176 KB. Its job really is to boot the first stage bootloader, which is the SPL or MLO. SPL stands for secondary program loader, MLO for memory loader. Now the first stage bootloader is going to load the second stage bootloader. In the case of BeagleBone Black, we are going to be using uh, a very popular bootloader called uBoot and its configuration file, which is uenv.txt. Now uBoot is open source, has a massive adoption in the embedded market. I would even hazard a guess and say almost 90% of embedded devices, which I've seen lately, uh, use uBoot as the default bootloader. Now, uBoot or the second stage bootloader is then going to bring up the Linux kernel, which can be a Z image or a U image, along with the device tree. And then the Linux kernel in turn is going to bring up the file system. Fantastic. So now let's understand how this process is actually going to work. I know this has been a long video, the next part is, is where we kind of summarize everything. And then in the next video, we do our first practical demo. Okay. So how does this actually work? So let's actually say that the AM335X is uh, the SOC over here, right? We've kept it here. And here is the ROM boot loader. And here is the internal RAM, uh, which we had found was around 128 KB. The ROM boot loader section, the, was around, I think, 176 KB, if I remember. Now, externally, you have the SD card, which is connected, or rather the kind of SD card, uh, you know, kind of socket right now, there is no card in there. <laughs> and then you also have RAM on the system, right? So now what we do is we insert our SD card. And on that SD card, we are going to have three partitions. The first partition is actually going to be a FAT32 partition and that will contain the first stage bootloader, which is MLO, and the second stage bootloader, U-boot, uh, 
and then the second stage bootloader's configuration file, uh, which is uenv.txt. Actually, it's more of environment variables than actual config, but uh, we'll get to that. Let's just kind of keep it simple right now. The second partition is an ext4 partition, which is going to contain the Linux kernel and the device tree binary. Right, so the device tree basically, you know, kind of is, is nothing but an enumeration of all the non discoverable devices and how to bring them up and how to power them on their power profiles, etc. We'll talk about it later. The third partition is what will contain our familiar root file system, right, that entire directory structure, which all of us are so used to seeing. Now you can partition the SD card differently. But for this video series, this is how I'm going to kind of do it because a lot of times I'd like to quickly change my kernel, change, you know, uanv.txt. So I, I prefer having all of these in separate partitions. Okay, so now how would this work? Let's summarize. So step one, we power up the SOC, the ROM bootloader starts running, the ROM bootloader when we are actually going to be using, you know, this, the second way to boot it, which is it is going to search for a FAT32 partition on the SD card. So the ROM bootloader decides that it's going to look into the SD card in its boot sequence, and then inside that finds the FAT32 partition, sees that there is an MLO, a file named MLO inside it, and then brings it into its internal RAM. Now, if MLO does not exist and of course boot will fail from the SD card and then the ROM bootloader will move on to the next device in the list. So step one to summarize it gets the MLO puts it into RAM and then passes control to it right now the MLO in turn will go ahead check for U-boot and then copy U-boot onto the RAM. Now this differentiation is very, very critical, right? If you notice the ROM bootloader got MLO into its internal RAM while MLO got U-boot into the external RAM. This is important. And I'll get to a couple of implications in just a bit. U-boot in turn is actually going to check if, you know, uenv.txt is present and then it'll go ahead and copy that out to the RAM as well. Now, U-boot intern is going to go ahead, fetch the Linux kernel and the device tree binary. And how would U-boot actually know that there is an ext4 partition, it's a second partition, etc. Well, all of that information is actually there in uenv.txt. So U-boot now fetches the Linux kernel and the device tree binary, loads them up into RAM, then also goes ahead, passes the boot arguments, and then goes ahead and passes control to the kernel, which in turn will mount the root file system and then run the init process from the file system in RAM. And the init process in turn will initiate other user space programs. Fantastic. So if you understood this, you pretty much now understand in and out how the boot process for the BeagleBone Black and actually most embedded devices work, right? The key variation for other devices is actually just going to be the first step, which is how the ROM bootloader, after you know getting one or two more stages or whatever it does, finally manages to put U-boot into memory and passes control. Just that part is going to be very boot specific. Once U-boot comes up, is in memory, the rest of it is going to be always the same, right? So of course, you are asking some questions which are very intuitive, right? Just why the hell do we even need the first stage bootloader MLO, right? Why can't the ROM bootloader just pretty much just fetch U-boot and run it from internal RAM? I mean, why do we even need the first stage bootloader? Now, it is very important to remember that the internal RAM was only 128 KB. While if you look at U-Boot size with all the functionality U-Boot has built in, it is never going to be able to fit within the internal RAM of the SOC. And RAM within an SOC is crazy expensive. So the only way SOC vendors manage to keep their costs down is to make sure that 
you know, the ROM, RAM and, and, and some of these really expensive memory is actually kept at a minimum. And this is the reason why you will always find that the whole first, second and sometimes even end stages may be required, right? So this is something very, very kind of important to keep in mind, uh, which is U-boot is so large that, you know, it cannot fit inside the internal RAM. Now, of course, your next logical question is, well, okay, why doesn't the ROM boot loader uh, then just load U-boot directly into RAM. Fair enough, it doesn't have to load it into internal RAM, but it can load it directly into RAM, right? Now, this is a very interesting question. And the, the answer really is that keep in mind that the SOC vendor at the time of when he actually made the SOC knows very little about the external devices you're going to connect to it. And typically, you know, DRAM controllers <clears throat> Uh, depend a lot on you know the product manufacturer how they built it and there are so many things which actually goes into making the controller work and making the RAM function so unfortunately the ROM bootloader will have no idea how to work and configure this RAM and hence it cannot directly load U-boot onto the RAM the MLO actually understands how this specific RAM uh, controller works, and it is going to set everything up so that the RAM becomes functional. And that is the reason why we require the MLO in between and the ROM bootloader cannot just take U-boot and put it in RAM, right? I hope I was very, very clear with this explanation. It's very interesting, but once you know this, you understand the purpose of the first stage bootloaders on many systems, there could even be more stages, keep in mind. In reality, all we are trying to do is go from the ROM bootloader to setting up the RAM, and in between we may require as many stages as you know required depending on the SOC's architecture. Once the RAM is set up, uh, the DRAM controller is kind of functional and up, after that we can put in U-boot and all the programs we know and love onto RAM and execute it, right? So this part is very critical to understand and digest. Okay, this was a long video guys and I hate doing videos which may go beyond 10 minutes because I know it's extremely difficult to stay focused and sharp, but I really wanted to do this one video, you know, within a sitting. So I promise not to kind of exceed more than 10 to 15 minutes in a video, but hopefully you enjoyed this session. It actually took me, I'm not kidding you, two days to build out the slides for just this video. I had to go through the TRM documents and a ton of other stuff. So I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you are not a student of Pentester Academy, please do consider joining us. We have a ton of courses in there. And if you are, I hope you're enjoying and please tell your friends and colleagues about us. Thank you. Have a great day ahead.